is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. And let us remember that our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. And now grace to you and peace from God Almighty and Jesus Christ our Lord through the powerful work of God's Holy Spirit. Amen. Nothing, nothing is able to separate us from the love of God in Jesus Christ. Let us now in freedom confess the wrong we have done, knowing that God is sure to forgive. Let us pray. Often, O holy and righteous God, we dare your justice, mock your mercy, jeer your patience, slight your power, and show content for your love. We even say I'm sorry insincerely and confess our sins flippantly. We plead your help to own up carefully to how we have wronged you, to admit honestly how we have grieved you, to plead penitently 
for your mercy and pardon. We beg your forgiveness through Jesus Christ, our Savior and our Lord. Amen. of God, hear these words of assurance from Psalm 32. Happy are those whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Happy are those to whom the Lord imputes no iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. I can proclaim to you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ that your sins are forgiven. God has accepted you and embraced you as God's very own. God has made you a new creation. Believe this, for it is true. And then the question is, how do we respond? How do we show our gratitude for God's grace and mercy? These words from the Gospel according to John give us good guidance on how we are to live. I give you a new commandment, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also should love one another. Amen. El Salter reading is from Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord my whole life long. the children. When my daughters were little, we read stories every night, and one of our favorites was Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs. This story takes place in a tiny town called Chew and Swallow. This town was unusual because of its weather. Everything that everyone ate came from the sky. In our Bible story, we will read about a time when something almost exactly like that happened. God's people, the Israelites, had been prisoners for many years. When they were finally freed and left Egypt, they were looking for the land God promised them. After they had been wandering lost around the desert for a couple of months, the people started to grumble and complain. They were hungry. God heard the people complaining, 
and told Moses in the morning after the dew was gone, there would be manna on the ground, enough for everyone. All they had to do was go out, pick it up, and eat it. Manna is like bread, and God sent enough manna to feed every person every day. Why did God do this for those grumblers and complainers? He did it so that they would know that God loved them and would take care of them. We must trust that God will provide because we depend on a caring God that always gives us what we need. Years later, Jesus saw a large crowd and he felt deep concern for them. They were like sheep without a shepherd. After a long day teaching this crowd, Jesus knew the people needed to eat. Someone in the crowd shared five loaves and two fish. Jesus gave thanks for what was given, and with it, he was able to feed thousands abundantly. What truth can we take from these stories and hold in our hearts? First, we can trust God for all of our needs. We depend on God, and he always provides enough for all. Second, we see that God provided manna for the hungry people in the desert, and Jesus provided bread for the large crowd. This reveals the Son is the exact likeness of God. Before anything was created, the Son of God was already there. He holds everything together. Isn't it a good feeling to know that Jesus is holding everything together? I listened to a podcast this week, and I heard something that I want to share with you. What if I told you that the same God who is powerful enough to fling the heavens across the skies, the God who shines so brightly that Moses could only look at his back, the God who holds the wisdom of creation in his hands, also came to be one of us. Let's give thanks to God who was pleased to live in Christ so he might live among us. Dear God, we thank you for giving us all we need every day. We depend on you. Please help us learn to trust you for all things big and small. Lord, let our faith be steady and firm. Thank you for choosing to become a person like us so we can come close to you. Amen. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust consume and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust consumes and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Let us pray. Dear God, we offer you our praise. We offer you our hearts. We offer you our money. We offer you our lives. Thank you for everything you give to us. Amen.
Now, hear the word of God. Our first reading is from the Old Testament, the book of Exodus, chapter 16, bread from heaven. The whole congregation of the Israelites set out from Elam, and Israel came to the wilderness of Sin, which is between Elam and Sinai, on the 15th day of the second month after they had departed from the land of Egypt. The whole congregation of the Israelites complained against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. The Israelites said to them, If only we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt when we sat by the flesh pots and ate our fill of bread, for you have brought us out, of, out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Then the Lord said to Moses, I'm going to rain bread from heaven for you, and each day the people shall go out and gather enough for that day. In that way I will test them, whether they will follow my instruction or not. On the sixth day, when they prepare what, I, what they bring in, it will be twice as much as they gather on other days. So Moses and Aaron said to all the Israelites, In the evening you shall know that it was the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt, and in the morning you shall see the glory of the Lord because he has heard your complaining against the Lord. For what we are, that you complain against us. And Moses said, When the Lord gives you meat to eat in the evening and you fill of bread in the morning, because the Lord has heard the complaining that you utter against them, what are we? Your complaining is not against us, but against the Lord. Then Moses said to Aaron, Say to the whole congregation of the Israelites, Draw near to the Lord, for he has heard your complaining. And as Aaron spoke to the whole congregation of the Israelites, they looked towards the wilderness, and the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. The Lord spoke to Moses and said, I have heard the complaining of the Israelites. Say to them, At twilight you shall eat meat, and in the morning you shall have your fill of bread. Then you shall know that I am the Lord your God. In the evening, quails came up and covered the camp. And in the morning, there was a layer of dew, dew around the camp. When the layer of dew lifted, there on the surface of the wilderness was a fine, flaky substance, as fine as frost on the ground. When the Israelites saw it, they said to one another, What is it? For they did not know what it was. Moses said to them, It is the bread that the Lord has given you to eat. This is what the Lord has commanded. Gather as much of it as each of you needs, an omer to a person according to the number of persons, all providing for those in their own tents. The Israelites did so, some gathering more, some less. But when they measured it with an omer, those who gathered much had nothing over, and those who gathered little had no shortage. They gathered as much as each of them needed. And Moses said to them, Let no one leave any of it over until morning. But they did not listen to Moses. Some left part of it until morning, and it bred worms and became foul. And Moses was angry with them. Morning by morning they gathered it as much as each needed. But when the sun grew hot, it melted. On the sixth day, they gathered twice as much food, two omers apiece. When all the leaders of the congregation came and told Moses, he said to them, This is what the Lord has commanded. Tomorrow is a day of solemn rest, a holy Sabbath to the Lord. Bake what you want to bake and boil what you want to boil, and all that is left over put aside to be kept until morning. So they put it aside until morning as Moses commanded them, and it did not become foul, and there were no worms in it. Moses said, Eat it today, for today is a Sabbath to the Lord. Today you will not find it in the field. For six days you shall gather it, but on the seventh day, which is the Sabbath, there will be none. On the seventh day, some of the people went out to gather, and they found none. The Lord said to Moses, How long will you refuse to keep my commandments and instructions? See, the Lord has given you the Sabbath. Therefore, on the sixth day, he gives you food for two days. Each of you stay where you are. Do not leave your place on the seventh day. So the people rested on the seventh day. The house of Israel called it manna. It was like coriander seed, white. And the taste of it was like wafers made with honey. 
Moses said, this is what the Lord has commanded. Let an omer of it be kept throughout your generations in order that they may see the food with which I fed you in the wilderness when I brought you out of the land of Egypt. And Moses said to Aaron, take a jar and put an omer of manna in it and place it before the Lord to be kept throughout your generations. As the Lord commanded Moses, so Aaron placed it before the covenant for safekeeping. The Israelites ate manna for 40 years until they came to a habitable land. They ate manna until they came to the border of the land of Canaan, and Omer is a tenth of an ephah. Our epistle reading is from Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 through 23, the supremacy of Christ. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, for in him all things in heaven and on earth were created, things visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or powers, all things have been created through him and for him. He himself is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he might come to have first place in everything. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. And through him God was pleased to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, by making peace through the blood of his cross. And you who were once estranged and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in his fleshly body through death, so as to present you holy and blameless and irreproachable before him, provided that you continue securely established and steadfast in the faith, without shifting from the hope promised by the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven, I, Paul, became a servant of this gospel. Our gospel reading from the gospel according to Mark, chapter 6, verses 30 through 44, the feeding of the 5,000. The apostles gathered around Jesus and told him all that they had done and taught. He said to them, come away to a deserted place all by yourselves and rest a while. For many were coming and going, and they had no leisure even to eat. And they went away in the boat to a deserted place by themselves. Now many saw them going and recognized them, and they hurried there on foot from all the towns and arrived ahead of them. As he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion for them, because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. When it grew late, his disciples came to him and said, This is a deserted place, and the hour is now very late. Send them away so that they may go into the surrounding country and villages and buy something for themselves to eat. But he answered them, You give them something to eat. They said to him, Are we to go and buy 200 denarii worth of bread and give it to them to eat? And he said to them, How many loaves have you? Go and see. When they had found out, they said, Five and two fish. Then he ordered them to get all the people to sit down in groups on the green grass. So they sat down in groups of hundreds and fifties. Taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and blessed and broke the loaves and gave them to his disciples to set before the people. And he divided the two fish among them all. And all ate 
and were filled. And they took up twelve baskets full of broken pieces and of the fish. Those who had eaten the loaves numbered five thousand men. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. As a child, I loved the Bible story about the bread from heaven called manna. See, children intuitively see both the generosity of God and the stubbornness of the Israelites. Maybe the children's Bible helped to solidify the image of God's bounty, as well as the complaining, ungrateful people of Israel. Yes, it did not take long for ancient Israel to not only forget how much they had suffered as slaves in Egypt, but to actually long back to their horrible situation. The story of God's caring for the Israelites in the wilderness gives us a wonderful insight in who God truly is. God is the Almighty, the Creator, our Father, our Parent, whom we can trust to generously and abundantly provide. There are two assertions that provide the spine of God's storyline as Israel tells it. God brought us out of Egypt, and God brought us into the promised land. And these were the defining moments of Israel's existence before God. Now, there is a significant time in between these two events. A lot of things happened between the exodus out of the land of Egypt and the entry into the promised land. The time after God brought them out of Egypt and brought them into the promised land was a long and eventful 40 years. And we know that this was a time of uncertainty, hardship, challenges, and danger. Israel was tested whether they would unconditionally trust God. And as we know, Israel time and again failed this test. Israel complained constantly. In this chapter alone, the word complain appears more than eight times. Old Testament scholar Brevard Childs points out that complain is not a casual gripe. But in fact, it is unbelief which has called into question God's very election of a people. At the same time, however, the time in the wilderness was a time when God sustained them and cared for them in extraordinary ways. God showered unto them generous attention a willingness, and a capacity to overturn dangerous and life-threatening circumstances for Israel. God fed and provided Israel with what she needed in a context where none seemed available. And God in this chapter provides bread in a wondrous way. You see, the verb eat in Exodus 6, verse 8, literally means to be satisfied or saturated. And it points to God's extravagant generosity. God gives abundantly beyond Israel's need. God is the God who performs in situations of hazardous scarcity in order to generate abundance. God meets their request for food, not to satisfy their grumblings, but in order that Israel may learn who God is through his gracious act of sustenance. Evidence of God's generous sustenance is spread throughout the chapter. In words like these, gather as much of it as each of you need. Some gather more, some less, but those who gathered more had nothing over, and those who gathered little had no shortage. This had a purpose for Israel to learn an important lesson. 
When some disobeyed and kept apart for the next day, it immediately spoiled bread worms and stank. Israel was taught that this bread came morning by morning in God's time according to God's plan. It could not be stored just in case. There was one exception, of course, to the rule. On the sixth day, God provided food for two days, and this time the food would not become foul, and there were no worms in it. The Sabbath day is not a day to go hungry and mourn. Rather, Israel is to eat, for today is God's special day. But not everyone obeyed and enjoyed the Sabbath, of course. Some were out hunting for manna. And then God says, how long will you refuse to keep my commandments? You see, God gives them a double portion of bread. What God demands is a different way of life. A life that is writ of anxiety because of a deep-rooted trust in a caring God who is sure to provide enough. The theological essence is the same for us as it was for Israel back then. God still is the giver of abundant life. God generates a world of blessing where none seemed possible. The gifts of life bear witness to God's capacity to bring life and fruitfulness out of circumstances of chaos and conditions of barrenness. This is what God does from the very beginning. God takes the formlessness of chaos and turns them into a life-enhancing order. God transforms a situation of chaos and scarcity into one of productivity, well-being, and fruitfulness. God transforms scenes of hopelessness into occasion of life, possibility, and joy. Israel's test was to believe in God, to trust God's generosity, and to embrace God's loving care. And this is our test, too. These transformative actions of God are taken up in the New Testament in the person of Jesus, the Son of God. The Gospel of Mark presents Jesus as the Son of God who has authority. And in chapter 6, Jesus and his disciples went to a deserted place. Notice how many times there is a reference to a deserted place. Three times. The people were like sheep without a shepherd. Jesus had compassion with them and he taught them many things. But then the hour was late and people were hungry. And the disciples wanted to send them away, but Jesus said to them, You give them something to eat. And all they had were five loaves of bread and two fish. Certainly not enough to feed all of them. And then Jesus took the bread and fish. He looked up to heaven. He blessed and broke the loaves and gave it to his disciples to serve the crowd. They did so. And then something astonishing happened. Everyone was fed. And there are 12 baskets full of leftovers. This after 5,000 men, not counting women and children, had eaten. This story, on the face of it, is about a wondrous feeding. The narrative, however, is more dense than a simple account of feeding. Let me explain You see, the way Mark is writing about Jesus, taking the bread and fish, looking up, blessing and breaking the loaves of bread and giving it to his disciples, deliberately uses the language of communion. He took, he blessed, he broke, and he gave it. 
communion. We are therefore included in the compassionate action of Jesus. You see, Jesus, when he saw the crowd, he had compassion for them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. They had no shepherd to lead, to feed, or comfort them. There was no one to do what God had done in the Old Testament. Remember that God in the Old Testament had intervened in situations of uncertainty, hardship, challenges, and dangers. And God transformed these situations into one of well-being and divine care. Remember that God in the Old Testament showered unto Israel generous attention, a willingness and a capacity to overturn dangerous and life-threatening circumstances. God fed Israel and provided a source of adequate food in a context where none seemed viable or available. And now, Jesus is doing exactly what God did in the Old Testament for Israel. Jesus has compassion on the people. He is attentive to their need, and he provides them with life-giving nourishment. Life-giving in the form of bread and fish, but also life-giving in the sense of communion with the body of Christ. The Mark narrative ends with a statement of abundance of God's life-giving gift. There is more than enough for all with enough to spare. People of God, this is who God is. This is what God does. God intervenes in situations that are life-threatening where there is no hope joy, situations of scarcity and oppression, and then God transforms them into an oasis full of life, a hopeful and joyous place. Colossians reaffirms that Jesus, in fact, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, for in him all things in heaven and earth were created. He himself is before all things, and in him all things hold together. In him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him God was pleased to reconcile to himself all things. This ancient hymn shows that what God did for Israel, God in Jesus Christ does for all. God is present in Jesus. What does this mean? This means that God creates, and in Christ he is still the one who can transform any circumstance of chaos into an ordered context of fruitfulness, blessing, prosperity, and well-being. God promises, and in Christ is still the one who can move decisively against every situation of barrenness and transform it into a circumstance of well-being, joy, and possibility. The promise of God counters any situation of despair, whether in the barrenness of ancient families or in the exhaustion of technological societies that believe there are no gifts to be given. God delivers, and in Christ is still the God who can disrupt any circumstance of social bondage and exploitation overthrow ruthless orderings of public life, and authorize new circumstances of dancing freedom, dignity, and justice. God who commands, and in Christ is still the God who can bring any circumstance under a sovereign decree, insisting on holiness and justice, thereby creating a livable order an order where righteousness is guaranteed and a community is made possible. 
God who commands leads us to refuse to accept any situation of autonomy wherein might makes right and greedy brutality is accepted as the norm. God who guides and tests is in Christ still the God who can transform any circumstance of deathly abandonment and threat into a place of nourishment and life. God, who guides and tests, leads us to refuse to accept circumstances of wretchedness that bring death, circumstances that deny the possibility of a good and meaningful life in the most unlikely situations. Yes, God is indeed able to turn the worst situations into a life-giving one. God lovingly provides ordered life in the midst of deathly chaos, possibility for a future in the midst of despair, dancing freedom instead of oppression, obedience in viable community instead of absolutizing autonomy and nourishment, and care instead of wretched abandonment. The Bible is full of evidence that this is what God does. The test for people of faith is whether we really believe that God is still able and willing to do so in our time. Amen. Let us now affirm our faith in the living God, and we do so in the words as they are in the bulletin from the church in South Africa. We believe in God the Father, who created all the world, who will unite all things in Christ, and who wants all people to live together as brothers and sisters in one family. We believe in God the Son, who became man, died, and rose in triumph to reconcile all the world to God to break down every separating barrier of race, culture, or class, and to unite all people into one body. God summons both the indiv individual and society, both the church and the state, to seek reconciliation and unity between all in justice and freedom for all. We believe in God the Spirit and pledge of God's coming reign, who gives the church power to proclaim the good news to all the world, to love and serve all people, to strive for justice and peace, to warn the individual and the nation of God's judgment, and to summon them both to trust the good news and obey Jesus Christ as King. Amen. The Lord be with you and also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God, for it is holy and right to do so. Eternal God, we worship you. From you we, we receive the gift of life, and we are constantly amazed about your divine generosity and abundance that you bestow on us. In you we find the meaning of life. With you we face the demands of life and no, we are never alone. You are good to us in ways beyond number, O oh God. We give you thanks for family and friends, even as we miss each other's presence. 
We pray for people who walk the fine line between truth and compromise. Parents who must answer their children's difficult questions about life and prove the answers by the way they live. So it's people tempted to tailor the truth to close a deal. Politicians who would promise the people whatever they want and so fail to provide the leadership we need. Young people under pressure to conform because it's so difficult to be different. Stand with all who need to take a stand, O God, and leaven our society with people of integrity. We pray for those who waste and those who want in our world. Teach us to distribute the bounties of the earth with greater wisdom and justice. We pray for people who must wait today for an illness to be cured, a baby to be born, a loved one to die, for peace to be made, or a child to come home. O God, who never hurries and is never late, give patience to all who are waiting today and faith that good things will come to us in your good time. If not what we seek, then the better things you know we need. On this day, we pray for humanity who are wrestling with this pandemic. Help us to wait. Help us, O God, to live in a way that we will find hope knowing that the future belongs to you. On this day, we pray, O oh God, for people whose names we know and whom we love. We pray for Carolyn Cromer, Craig DeRusso. We thank you that he has uh, recovered from COVID-19. Be with Bob Frank, who is recovering from surgery. We pray for Sharon and Bob Ryder. We pray for our homebound members and everyone who has been affected affected by the pandemic. We pray for all refugees, victims of natural disasters, war, and violence. We pray for Deborah and her baby, Hannah Joy, Joy Alice McDavid, uh, Hannah Phillips' uh, niece. We thank you that Deborah is doing better. We continue that you will be with them. We pray that you will be with them, O oh God. Hear us as we pray for others, as we pray for them in the silence of our hearts. Move among us by your Spirit, we pray, that our worship may move from an occasional hour to a life of grateful praise, secure in your love, guided by your word, empowered to run the race set before us in the strong name of Jesus, who calls us to follow and leads all the way. And we pray as he taught us, saying in one voice, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
that God is able to turn the worst situation into a life-giving one. God provides abundantly. Go into this world and trust God, and as you do so, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God Almighty, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. Amen.